Let's play a game. All right. On the count of three, name the top issue noted by the SEC in their comment letters to registrants. Don't even think about it. Just name it. Ready? One, two, three. Non-gap financial measures. measures. What? Did we just become best friends? Yup. Do you want to do a podcast episode on it? Yup. Welcome to Gap Chats, the podcast dedicated to all things accounting, brought to you by Gap Dynamics. I'm your host, Mike Walworth, and with me, as always, is my faithful partner, Chris Brundrett. We hope you'll join us on our journey today as we share our passion for accounting and help change the way you train. Today, we are talking about non-GAAP financial measures disclosed by public companies in their annual reports and other filings with the SEC. Chris, let me ask you a quick question. Why did we pick this topic? Well, as we alluded to in the introduction, disclosure of non-GAAP financial measures has always been a number one area of SEC comment letters over the over the past several years. And as such, it's always a topic of discussion at the annual AICPA and SEMA conference on current SEC and PCOB developments. And was it was it did they mention it this year? Absolutely. It was a big, big topic of discussion and some new interpretive guidance is out, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Okay. And and what's what about the popular? I mean, do are companies using? I mean, obviously companies are using non-GAAP financial measures, but are they using them more lately? Non-GAAP financial measures are more popular than ever, and according to PwC, the use of non-GAAP measures reported by public companies is increasing exponentially. In 1996, now I know that was a long time ago, but 1996, 59 percent of S and P 500 companies used at least one non-GAAP measure. While in 2020, that number jumped up to 94%. So almost every public company out there is disclosing at least one non-GAAP financial measure. Well, I, I didn't I didn't realize, I guess, it was that high. What's causing the increase, or I guess perhaps said a different way, you know, why do companies use non-GAAP financial measures? Well, it helps companies better tell their story. These measures play an important role in delivering a company's view of its financial or operating results to supplement what's already captured in the GAAP financial statements. Management believes that non-GAAP financial measures provide investors with valuable insight into the information that management considers important when running the business. Well, I guess that's certainly one take, and you sound very SEC-esque of you. Uh, I guess alternatively, you could say that it helps companies paint a rosier picture than is otherwise portrayed under GAAP. It's like the Instagram filter uh, for GAAP financial statements. I kind of like what the former SEC accountant Lynn Turner said at best. In 2020, he was describing non-GAAP financial measures, and he he said it's everything but the bad stuff. Well, that's... Uh, usually, I will say non-GAAP financial measures present things better than their comparative GAAP measure, uh, but uh, that's why this is such a hot topic, right? But we're we're also kind of jumping ahead a little bit. All right, I'll I'll bring it I'll bring it back. So so let's let's start from the beginning. What exactly is a non-GAAP financial measure? Quite simply, a non-GAAP financial measure is a numerical measure that excludes or includes amounts that are otherwise included or excluded in the comparable measure that's been calculated and presented under GAAP. Um, All right, so can you give us some examples of non-GAAP financial measures used by companies? There are lots of them, but one that most people are familiar with and one of the most common examples is EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes, and also EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Companies might also present adjusted earnings or adjusted EBITDA, which remove various one-time, irregular, or non-recurring items from either earnings or EBITDA. But these are very common. Yeah, I've also seen companies use a measure, it's free cash flow. What's that? That's another really common one. And free cash flow is typically calculated as cash flows from operating activities, right? Coming from the cash flow statement prepared under GAAP less capital expenditures. So that's sort of the free cash flow. Okay. And so where are non-GAAP financial measures presented? So where do registrants actually include non-GAAP financial measures in the in the filings? 
Well, they're in SEC filings, Forms 10-Q, 10-K. They can be in registration statements like an S-1 or an S-4, earnings releases, really any public disclosures. And it could be even uh, measures found on a company's website or in or in analyst or investor presentations. So do, do they actually include these things in the GAAP financial statements? Absolutely not. Financial statements are always presented in accordance with U.S. GAAP. Always have been, always will be. Where you find non-GAAP financial measures is outside of the financial statement. So if you think about in a 10K, you would find these in the MD&A, Management's Discussion and Analysis. Very common place for non-GAAP measures, but you know they can be all over the place in other parts of the filing that are outside of the financial statements, but they're also in, in other filings or 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 uh, presentations uh, by a company you find them in press releases quite commonly the rules that we're going to talk about even apply to verbal uh, discussions such as earnings calls and you know what specifically are the rules that govern these non-gap financial measures well first let's clarify that non-gap financial measures are only really a public company issue right these are SEC rules uh, and as such it is the SEC that's providing the guidance and it consists of several things we have regulation G and regulation G was sort of born out of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act all those years ago and we have item 10E of regulation SK uh, within the SEC's rules and we have compliance and disclosure interpretations, otherwise known as CNDIs. Okay, backing up a bit, these are a little bit of like a layer, right? There's layers okay. of these uh, of these regulations. We'll start off with Regulation G. Now, Regulation G applies to all non-GAAP financial measures. It doesn't matter whether it's in written communications, such as you know a, a filing like a 10K in the MDNA, or a press release, or even verbal communications. Reg G always applies. It applies everywhere. And when disclosing a non-GAAP financial measure, Regulation G uh, requires presentation of the most comparable financial measure calculated and presented in accordance with GAAP, and a reconciliation of the difference between the non-GAAP financial measure presented and the comparable measure that's been presented and calculated in accordance with GAAP. Moving on, we have item 10E of Regulation SK. Now, this regulation is a bit more restrictive. Now, it applies to written communications. To make it a little trickier, and we won't get into the details here today, but certain portions of Regulation SK will apply to things like earnings releases, most importantly, the predominance requirement that we'll talk about here in a minute, whereas all of Item 10E will apply to uh, non-GAAP financial measures that you would find in MD&A and a 10K, for example. So understanding those layers and where these different rules or pieces of these rules apply is important. There's lots of good discussion out there on the internet. This is kind of a legal issue, so you'll see this a lot of times uh, discussed by law firms. So with item 10E of Regulation SK, again, more restrictive, it requires companies to disclose, when using non-GAAP financial measures, the most directly comparable GAAP financial measure, a quantitative reconciliation, and management's purpose for using the non-GAAP measure. Does Regulation SK say anything else? It does. It says quite a few additional things. One I've already mentioned, it says that a registrant should not uh, present the non-GAAP financial measure in a manner that would give it greater authority or prominence over the comparable GAAP measure. So you'll hear this prominence uh, sort of discussion uh, quite a bit when we talk about some of the findings that the SEC has had. Um, in addition, a registrant should not exclude charges or liabilities uh, that required or will require cash settlement, absent an ability to settle in another manner from non-GAAP liquidity measures. So you got to be careful with uh, liquidity measures that are set, you know, where we have a settlement in cash. Um, in addition, a registrant should not adjust a non-GAAP performance measure to eliminate or smooth items identified as non-recurring infrequent or unusual. Now they continue to state that applies when, number one, the nature of the change or gain is such that it is reasonably likely to occur within two years, or two, 
there is a similar change or gain within the prior two years. Bottom line is, be very careful with anything that is referred to as non-recurring, infrequent, or unusual, because oftentimes if something happens once, it's going to happen again. It's okay to adjust for these things, but call it what it is. Be very careful. And that's what this rule is saying and some of the interpretations we'll talk about later about using terminology such as non-recurring, infrequent, or unusual. It, it darn well better meet that definition. Okay. All right. And finally, a registrant should not present non-GAAP financial measures on the face of the financial statements. We, Mike, you already asked that question and we covered that because those are prepared in accordance with GAAP. Therefore, non-GAAP financial measures do not belong in the financial statements, either on the face or in the notes. And then the question is, is, you know, I know reading some of the SEC comments, this idea of sort of describing a non-GAAP measure gap like you know so they you know operating income i mean yeah that's know. been a really big issue so that's one of the rules uh in uh sk is says look you can't use titles or descriptions of non-gap financial measures that are the same as or confusingly similar to titles or descriptions used for the gap financial measures so that's been a big issue. Uh, you really, really have to label these clearly as non-GAAP and, and avoid any confusion where people might think, well, I don't know, is it GAAP? Is it non-GAAP? Right? Clearly, clearly labeled. So it's does the SEC, are they actually discouraging the use of non-GAAP? No, they are not, right? They are not discouraging the use of non-GAAP, but what they are very clearly saying and what they say every year uh, when it when this issue comes up is you can use these measures as long as you follow the rules, right? You have to follow the rules. And so understanding the rules, understanding what rules apply to the various disclosures, as I mentioned earlier, sort of the layer of rules is really, really critical. Yeah. And you, and you mentioned earlier and, you know, you had these layers and we talked about Reg G, mm -hmm. you talked about the item 10E of Regulation SK and then you mentioned something about these C and DIs. So, so what are they? That's like uh, the these, last layer, right? Yeah, right, right. The, the, the compliance and disclosure interpretations, these are put out by the SEC staff. And they're, you know, there's many others, not just related to non-GAAP, but they're, they're very helpful sort of interpretive guidance on how to apply the SEC rules. And this one in particular has, it's, in a question and answer kind of format. And so, you know, it's sort of, can, you know, can we do, can, how do we do can this? Can we do can this? We no. Do this? Can we do this? No. Yeah. Right. Uh, but, but it, it has grown and, and changed over the years. It's been updated numerous times, but it, you know, it really is reflecting some of the issues that the SEC has seen out there. So it digs a lot deeper. Yeah. And, and didn't they just, I think you mentioned it maybe earlier when we were talking about the AICPA and SEMA conference, when we were at that conference, I heard that these C and DIs were most recently updated in December of 2022. Is that right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And so it was kind of cool, I guess, cool for us nerdy accountants that they were announcing the release of these updated uh, C and DIs at the conference. So just reflecting their current thoughts, you know, and things change, right? I mean, companies change things that they're disclosed, you know, over the years, new issues emerge. And so they're constantly updating these. But these are a really, really good resource. Very easy to read uh, because it's sort of in a question and answer format. Very helpful if you're dealing with these. Yeah, and I think what we're going to do is we're going to actually put a link to the most recently updated C and DIs in the note or in the description of this podcast, so listeners can can actually download that. So, what do these C and DIs say, Chris? Well, again, lots of different questions and answers, but you know, overall, they state that non-GAAP uh, measures can be misleading if they're presented inconsistently between periods, or you know, maybe if they exclude uh, charges but don't include, or but does not exclude gains. They clarify things like individually tailored accounting principles are not permitted. I mean, I could go on and on. There's a lot of issues that are addressed by this document. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I've heard a lot. I, th I think it was, well, the last time they were updated, I think was in 2018. But they, you know, I've heard a lot about these, quote unquote, individually tailored accounting principles. Yeah. Uh, can you give us a, an example of what would the SEC would consider a individually tailored accounting principle? Absolutely. And, and, and I can see why this has been a struggle for companies, because there's certainly some gray area between a non-GAAP financial measure 
right? Which is mm-hmm. including or excluding certain things. It wouldn't be in the comparable gap measure and a tailored accounting principle. So I think good one to, to highlight, Mike. So a good example of an individually tailored accounting policy, which uh, is not allowed, let's be clear about that, would be when a new pervasive accounting rule is adopted. And a great example would be ASC Topic 606, revenue from contracts with customers, or ASC 326, which is credit losses. So you know, some companies decided to disclose, for example, what their revenue would have been under the old standard ASC Topic 605. You know, for example, maybe accelerating revenue recognition to the current period that under the new rule uh, would have required them to recognize it over time, right? That is not allowed. Or what their allowance for credit losses would have been had they not had to implement the new expected credit losses model. Under the old model, it was lower. So you're disclosing a lower number. So, you know, the SEC does does not like that. I, I can I can see why because you know the FASB issues a new standard and companies are like screw it. I don't like this new standard. I don't know how I don't like how it makes me look. And uh, so I'm just going to continue to follow the old rules. Yeah, that's exactly right, and that's not allowed. Okay, so you know as as we mentioned before, we just got back from the AICPA SEMA conference in DC. You know, Vicky and I, we Gap Dynamics sponsored a, a table, or we were one of the, the the underwriters. And then you, Bob, Rachel, and Jenny actually attended the conference. And we mentioned they announced the release of these new and updated C and Dis. So, can you give us a little bit of insight on these updates? Absolutely. So, you know, it, again, it was just adding some additional questions and answers, and it's really looking at some examples, highlighting some of the hot topics in this area over the last few years. Because while non-GAAP financial measures has been a hot topic for many, many years, you know, what we, what sort of is the focus from year to year does change. Individually tailored accounting uh, principles has been kind of a hot topic last few years. They highlighted some others like it, like the prominence of presentation that we discussed. That's been a big issue and that makes uh, non-GAAP financial measures misleading. Well, what, I mean, is there any other high level takeaways? I mean, like I said, you attended the conference. I did not. I was manning the table representing GAP Dynamics. What other high level takeaways related to non GAAP financial measures? We probably do a different podcast, FYI. We'll probably do a different podcast on the big high level takeaways from the whole conference. But sure. regarding non GAAP financial measures, you know, what other takeaways did you have? Well, just one that pops into mind, you know, and this is, again, my opinion, but, you know, having looked at this or watched this issue uh, over the years and having been in practice when Reg G, you know, actually came out, it's been kind of a sort of a shifting of, of you know, what we sort of out here in practice think the SEC's views are on these things. And, and what I mean by that is when Reg G came out, uh, non-GAAP financial measures existed long before Reg G. And when that came out, people said, OK, well, the party's over right? The SEC sort of shutting it down. They don't want us to use these non-GAAP financial measures. It took a number of years. We actually saw a decline in, in for a little while in the number of measures. It, and it took a number of years, but the SEC came out. It was when they released the first version of the CNDI and they sort of said, hey, you know, time out. We're, we're okay with, you know, with companies using these measures. And we believe that sometimes they're very important for the readers of the financial state or the readers of the of the filing to understand where man you know management's view so we we aren't discouraging the use of them but if you use them you have to follow the rules and that's always been their take and so you know that's kind of that that came out and then you know when they sort of crack down a little bit more. There was sort of that feeling again that uh, maybe they don't want us using these measures, but you know they continue to clarify, we're okay with these measures being used as long as they are used properly. You need to follow the rules. So that's kind of the takeaway. So, you know, in your opinion, since you're, you're into giving opinions now, you've moved to the opinion piece of the thing. Um, what would you say are kind of like, if you had to pick five, Right. Yep. What are the top five like most common issues that the SEC has noted in its reviews of registrants regarding non-GAAP financial measures? I got to narrow it down to five. Huh? <laughs> yes. All right. Try. Well, let's try. Because I mean, everyone, everyone everyone likes a top five list. Right? I mean, because I I could get all kinds of, you know geeked out on this, and we could talk about you know all kinds of different issues. But no, if we had to narrow it down to five, I would say the prominence issue. So the GAAP measure not given enough prominence as compared to the non-GAAP measure. Um, the reconciliation, surprisingly, continues to be an issue um, between the gap and the non-gap measure. It's either missing 
or it doesn't start with the gap measure. They've clarified that numerous times over the years. The reconciliation starts with gap and ends with non-gap. It ties into that prominence thing that we just talked about. Another one, adjustments to eliminate or smooth items identified as non-recurring, infrequent, or unusual. They're not appropriate if those items are you know, not truly non-recurring, infrequent, or unusual. Um, that's been an issue. Uh, Non-GAAP measures uh, based on individually tailored accounting principles. We already highlighted that one. Um, And also management's explanation of why a non-GAAP measure is useful to investors. That is required. And sometimes it's missing, but other times it's it's there, but it's inconclusive. We don't really know why, right? I mean, it's not cool to say, oh, well, it's important because it's important, right? You got to explain a little bit. Yeah, so no boilerplate disclosures, right? right? Uh, Well, that is a pretty good list off the top of your head. Uh, I think it'd be a good, I mean, honestly, I think we could get into each of those in a bit more detail, and we probably should. And so we're, we're kind of out of time now, but would you agree to maybe do another podcast on these kind of five top top five issues that you noted? I think that sounds like a plan. Awesome. Well, why don't you take us out for this episode? That's all for this episode of Gap Chats, your source for all things accounting. Notes and resources from today's episode are linked in the description. And as always, you can find us online at gapdynamics.com and at gapdynamics across social media. It's never too late to become a gapologist. Head over to our website and subscribe to our blog so that you are the first to know what's new with Gap Dynamics. (laughs) 